Money Show. Personal Finance with Warren Ingram. So it's, uh, Americans are very big on this thing, uh, this idea of putting money into a college fund. And South Africans, I think, are coming to terms with the idea that certainly education is absolutely pivotal and crucial to the future of young people. And if you're not putting money away for that, uh, you're going to really struggle one day to pay for that education. So what does the financial services industry do? But it creates things called education policies or education savings products. And I wonder whether they worth anything. Director at Galileo Capital, personal financial advisor Warren Ingram, regular Money Show contributor. What are these education savings products, Warren? Mostly a load of rubbish, in all honesty. <laughs> uh, Can you tell us what I, you I really should, think? I, I should have said, stand back, I'm about to get on my soapbox, but I, I jumped on there too quickly. So... Just in structure, I mean, they are usually going to be um, a, a, an endowment um, and then, it, you know, they, get, they put a nice little name tag on it and call it education something. Uh, and, you know, every every parent out there who's got some money will look at this and say, you know, gee, I mean, I really want to you know, give my child or my children the best education I can. And, and you know, if this is called an education, whatever, then, then I must buy it because I need to educate my kids and the education is expensive. Etc. All of that is true. The, the problem is an endowment for most people uh, is really just not a good idea. I, I mean, what is it? Okay, just often, just yeah. before you before you go down the endowment route, just remind us what an endowment is. So it's a it's an insurance policy which is uh, which has a five year term and. Inside the insurance policy, uh, you, you can put money in whether you do it as a debit order every month or you put a lump sum in. But inside that policy, uh, it pays income tax at, a, at an income tax rate of 30%. And then it pays capital gains tax at a rate of 12%. So, so what happens is while, while you're putting money in, you, you experience no taxes as an investor because the, the, the investment itself is paying tax on an ongoing basis. Then one day, and the one day is at least a minimum of five years later, you can take the money out and you can decide, I'm going to take all the money out after five years, I'm going to leave it all in, or I'm going to draw a portion every day or every month, and you're entirely free to decide on your own. Uh, but, but when you take that money, it, it then lands in your hands, uh, apparently tax-free. And, and, and that's really the rub there is that you feel when you get it, you go, oh, gee, you know, I put money in and there's no capital gains tax or income tax or anything for me. I've just got this money. It's, it's completely tax free. And that's how they get sold to, to investors out there is this is a great tax free investment. Of course, the, the, the problem is that not really explaining that there's this 30 percent on income tax and 12 percent on capital gains tax. So, so you're probably, so you're probably paying, gonna, I mean, depending on what you earn, you're paying a pretty high tax rate then in your savings. True, but uh, let's take the example of, of a, a parent, you know, who, who says, okay, I'm going to um, start saving for my child's education at, you know, around about one year old and, and I can fund junior school. So what I need to do is I need to fund high school and I need to fund university. So, so that means you've got you've got a fairly long period of time, you know, anywhere from let's say, you know, 10, 11 years up to you know, uh, 18, 19 years. Uh, that, that means you really should be going into a high growth investment, so you know, something that predominantly invests in shares, which means you're going to pay almost no income tax on that investment while it's growing. You, you are going to pay capital gains tax when you decide to draw the money out of that investment one day. And and here here lies the rub is is the most capital gains tax that any of us would pay would be eighteen percent if we were paying it in our own name. Uh, the, the the one thing that SARS does give us because we we all know SARS wants their money so they don't give us much nowadays. But what they will do is every year the first forty thousand rands worth of profit that you make on an investment can be tax free in your hands. So if you think of mom and dad and and they decide every year that they're going to draw draw money to pay for the, the, the children's education from a growth investment. That means that the first 80,000 Rand, because it's 40,000 Rand per person, the first 80,000 Rand is going to be tax-free. And that's to, and that's of the growth. So assuming that they're spending, let, let's let's go crazy. Let's say they're spending 300,000 Rand a year on, on, on education. That, that means that they need an enormous amount of growth on that 300,000 Rand before they're going to pay any tax. 
any tax freeze. And, and, the, and the issue for me here is the endowment is, is regularly and consistently paying the income tax and the capital gains tax inside the endowment every single year. It just doesn't make sense to me. Where it does make sense, and I'll be fair to the industry, is if, you, if you're funding education from a trust, for example, because trusts are hugely penalized by, um, by, by capital gains tax as well. So, so certainly an endowment would be, would be better off there. Or if, you, if you're one of those people that's you know, paying a huge amount of capital gains tax every single year because you've got so many big investments that are generating so much uh, capital gains for you on a yearly basis, then perhaps an endowment might work. But for the ordinary Joe, the, 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 these things, if they're sold to you as a tax-free investment that's going to be tax efficient and give you lots of growth, I, I think it's simply not true. And we haven't even got to my, my real bugbear, which is the costs of these things, because most of the time they're not cheap. You know, they're, they're, if you're if you're being sold it by by an uh, you know insurance agent, uh, the, the likelihood is there's been some nice upfront fees that have been paid to that agent. That you know, then, then the endowment itself has got uh, you know a cost, and it's usually going to be around half to one percent a year. And then you're going to pay for the the underlying investments, whether those are you know shares or unit trusts or exchange traded funds. All of those costs tell you, and then you're not really getting much of a benefit, and you can't access the money for the first five years unless you start to do once-off withdrawals. There's a whole complicated thing around endowments, but 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 the reality is, uh, lousy products for most of us. You know, just not a great idea. And and uh, the the reason we're talking about it today is, uh, you know, in my industry we've got to do continuous education, and and I'm reading uh, some case studies from our from the phase ombud. So this is the ombud who actually regulates the advice my industry gives, and this is one of their biggest problems. The, these are products that are being sold on a regular basis in a really bad way to investors who don't know, who aren't explained. To, uh, or, or should, I should say, aren't told about all of the downsides. They're just told this is a tax-free investment, very often good for education. Why don't you buy it? And, and I just I, I just think we need to do a much better job of, of, of educating people out there and saying, you know, for, for the few, the very few endowments might be great for you. For, for, for the rest of us, uh, you know, ordinary humans, uh, look around, rather buy a unit trust, rather, rather buy an exchange traded fund. If you've got a long period of time to educate your, your, your children, or I should say to save before you need to pay for the education of your children, then, you know, please choose something that's got a huge amount in shares. You know, it could be a top 40 in investment or a general yeah. equity unit trust, just something tax, simple. And, and tax, keep free the cost save, tax free savings accounts. I mean, I couldn't think of a better purpose for a tax-free savings account than precisely this. Because, yes, you could only you know put in 500,000 rand at this stage in total. But if you start early and you put the 500,000 in, you get the capital gain tax-free. If markets behave as they should over 20 years, that money could be you know, worth three, four times as much as you've put in. Um, and, and there's your education plan. Kaboom, thank you very much. No tax, no questions, no asking, no fighting, no biting, no scratching. And there's a huge amount of flexibility within tax-free savings accounts. Uh, I, I agree about the flexibility. I, um, I think we may, maybe need to discuss the, the no fighting or the biting because it, it depends <laughs> on whose tax-free account you were using. So, so if you were using your own one, uh, you, you know, so one of the two or b- both parents were, were doing it. Uh, that's I, what I I'm take your point. About. It is, yeah. Uh, if, but, but, but perhaps equally, you could you could actually you know, you know put open the account for the child and let, and then let the child's tax-free pay, pay for education at varsity uh, stage, for example. But, but just as you said, right, right at the start, because I, I know what's going to happen now. Our, our social media is going to blow up with people saying, yeah, but, you know, uh, you, you've now used up all your lifetime capacity, et cetera. So, so for, for people who are not in a position that, that, that they're going to fill up their, their tax-free plus unit trusts plus all their retirement fund contributions, then this might be a, a, a decent option. But if you've got lots of extra money, then, then by all means, you know, don't use your tax-free only, do other things as well. I think the point here is don't focus on the tax, you know, focus on any, what's going to generate the most growth. Any investment offering other than a tax-free savings account, um, anything that is sold to you on the basis of, oh, but there's a tax advantage as the key selling point is surely not worth investing in. Well, I'm, I'm glad they're closed now, but there, there used to be these things called Section 12 J's. And if you read any of the marketing material from any of those <laughs> providers, or well, let's say most, that was... I think right at number one or number two of the, the key selling features. And I'd love to know how those things are performing at the moment. The actual investment performance, I suspect it's not great. I'm, I'd be curious, actually. Producers, should we get a, can we get a 12J person on? We had lots at one stage who were terribly keen to talk about their products back then. 
I wonder how they're doing. Warren Ingram with us this evening talking about personal finance, tax-free, uh, not tax-free savings accounts. Those are lovely education savings products for the vast majority of people, please. There are better options for you. Don't get caught up in the hype. In a moment, we have a question from Mike. Shares like Nuspat, Meta, Google, Alibaba, all down from 12-month highs. Some have lost half their value. Is the tech sector worth considering? Is it time to find new sectors for my investments? Good question, Mike. More on that in a moment with Warren Ingram, personal financial advisor and executive director at Galileo Capital. The Money Show. Personal finance with Warren Ingram. I was asking earlier, Warren, which is the worst performing share on the JSE this year of the last 12 months. And it turns out it's Process, the uh, third biggest company on the JSE, um, has fallen by nearly 45% this year. And I was then critical of the management of Nuspats, which split the company in two and took the international technology assets, put them in Holland in Process. And we've seen the, the share price really severely impacted, as we have with Nuspats as well. They have a common underlying um, asset in Tencent in China, which too has had an absolute bludgeoning over the last year or so. And Mike's question is, is it time to go back into these technology companies? I wonder what your view on that is. It's a um, it's a fabulous and timeless question. If we think that, uh, you know, a market darling like Netflix is down 40%, just about 40% in two days and nearly 70% in five months. So, so, so I think for me, when I look at uh, an entire sector that's taken a, a beating, I think you've got to be careful of, of, of putting all of these shares in the same kind of basket and, and, and you know, tre- treating them equally, either that they're all now terrible or they're all a buy or, or, or something in between. To me, I think it's important to understand that, that a lot of these businesses are, are fundamentally very different companies. And, and secondly, we need to understand why they've gone down. You know, if we look at a, a business like Naspers or Process, there's a lot going on that that they had very little control of. I mean, I think the fact that uh, you know they've got to write down seven hundred million dollars of, of investments in Russia to zero, and they had to do it overnight, and you know that was sanctions. That's not, nothing to do with 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 Process management at all. I mean, I think you know that that's a, a bolt from the blue. Uh, you, you know, you add to that the the, the Chinese government d- doing high speed kind of regulatory overhaul of of tech businesses. And you have to say that that there is a lot that's happened to them in a very short space of time. That that certainly was uh, beyond their control. And and you know, understanding that perhaps what's happening in China is is high speed medicine for the tech sector, but it doesn't mean that that, that the Chinese regulators want to kill the sector. And, and perhaps that regulatory uh, kind of medicine has been had now. And and, and certainly it looks like the, the Chinese government are are are, are not going to do much more. They they want to provide certainty. And and let's see what happens with Tencent, which is a, a massive holding for for Process and Naspers, and and you might find that 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 share is now, um, you know, if not horribly cheap, you know, maybe at fair 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 value, or, or maybe you know still still cheap. So so I think it's it's worth understanding a business like Netflix, uh, you know, there, there's huge kind of noise because they lost two hundred thousand subscribers the first time their subscriber base went down in a decade. But, but the context is they lost 1% of their subscriber base in a quarter, 1%. And, and that was after their subscriber numbers shot up in, in lockdown. It's probably natural that, that that some people would switch off those subscriptions once they're allowed outside again. So, so I think it's important to understand context. And for me, looking at the tech sector and, and rubbishing the entire sector because uh, you know, shares have gone down. I think is is not right. It, to, to me, I think there are still brilliant companies in the, in the in the sector, and, and I'm really looking for companies with very strong balance sheets. In other words, very little debt or hopefully no debt, sitting on piles of cash, generating increasing uh, revenue and increasing profits. You know, month after month, year after year, and, and those businesses will come through this. I, I think re- relatively comfortably, they'll probably be buying some of their competitors who get into trouble. And, and yes, there will be sectors, uh, shares in the sector that were overvalued, that are that are certainly over, you know, overdone, and, and that maybe don't deserve the valuations that they had. But, but I think, you know, I, I would be carefully looking at that tech sector and looking for bargains now, because I think 
think though there are bargains to be had. Um, I, I think I might have said it on the show a couple of weeks ago that for the first time in, in my career, I'm looking at a process NASPAS and, and wondering if it's if it's almost a value share now. And, and you know, I, I'm, I can't believe I'm saying it because I certainly always felt it was too expensive. But but I think it might be on the opposite end of that spectrum now. So. The, the tech sector as a whole, the, the, I wouldn't be piling into everything. Would I be piling into certain shares? D definitely, but but those with big balance sheets, strong cash flow, and making more and more profit, not less and less. Yeah, and I, I wonder what signal uh, Elon Musk's uh, sudden ardor for Twitter is sending. Any particular view on that? Because that strikes me as a signal that the world's gone mad. Well, well, the Twitter share price is down a lot, and and I think uh, you know he's 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 a smart man, Elon Musk. I'm I'm not convinced that he's doing this to make a fortune. Uh, the, the, this particular one, I think he wants his megaphone, um, and and you know the, the moral questions around this are are, are enormous. You know, we, we would all be uh, desperately terrified if 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 Donald Trump had bought Twitter. So so I think we've got to be careful of of these. You know, the richest man in the world with huge cash piles. But buying, you know, one of the big, biggest megaphones in the world, I, I think it, it needs to be resisted at all costs. So he's, so work, I, I he's working on his. Ego. He's working on his role for the next Bond movie to be the villain. You see, I'm, I'm, that's this is my personal pet theory that Elon Musk <laughs> wants to be a Bond villain. He's been in other films. He's appeared in other vanity projects, and he desperately wants to be cast um, as, as some sort of evil controller of information or something along those lines. And I bet the broccoli... No, anyway. I'm, I'm sure that, uh, um, that he is, is, is desperately keen to call the shots. He likes to call the shots, does Elon. Um, I, this is not one I've heard of before. What is Citus tax? Is it uh, when, when you've got a cold? And your nose is blocked, and it's a, a tax on tissues because you got citus, and you need to blow your nose. <laughs> and tissue prices have gone up. What is citus tax? <laughs> uh, no, and unfortunately not. But but it it, it is a, a swear word that starts with S. Um, so so it's it's about it's a form of death death or death taxes or estate duties, um, and citus because it's taxes that are levied where the asset itself lives or, or is domiciled or is registered. Ah, so ah, right. different to South Africa, where in South Africa, we pay tax in South Africa on all of our assets and all of our income around the world. But there's certain countries that will say, if you own an asset in our country and you die, uh, and, and that asset is it lives in our country or is, or is registered in our country or is listed on our stock market, then you might have to pay estate duty. And and so uh, in the States, for example, if you have a share or a property that's worth more than $60,000 and you're not a resident in America, you, you're, you're liable for a state duty of, um, of 40 percent, massive amount, uh, you know, double what, what you would pay in South Africa on everything over $60,000. It's, it's a big number. The, the same applies in the UK to, to assets over 325,000 pounds. So, so a lot more breathing room there. But, but, but something South Africans need to be aware of, that, you know, there are lots of banks that, that will open a bank account for you in the UK very easily and, you know, help you buy shares on the UK stock exchange. And I'm wondering how many people who've got these bank accounts and, and, and share portfolios in the UK know that, that they might end up having to pay 40% estate duty on those things on, on, their, pass, on their death, let me not say passing. Please don't say passing because that's what you do when you're stuck in traffic and you get a little dotted <laughs> line and then you may overtake. Another word for overtaking is passing. Um, if, you, uh, if your life on this planet expires, you die. You do not pass. You die. You are dead. You are no longer living. You are expired. You are now extinct. You are now a former person. You are no longer... God, we put a we, I mean, we, we <laughs> soft soap death. I wish we didn't. Warren Ingram, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for joining us this evening, as always, on a Thursday evening. I wonder if you'll come back. Uh, Warren Ingram from Galileo Capital, personal finance on a Thursday.